Hello, I'm Stan Karoff. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the United States, or MHAUS. Uh, I'm interested in drug-induced uh, hyperthermias like neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Dr. Rosenberg has an extensive uh, record of achievement in clinical research and educational areas of anesthesiology. He currently serves as the Director of Medical Education and Clinical Research at the St. Bartimus Medical Center in New Jersey. In addition, he's President of the Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the United States and is really known nationally and internationally as a champion and advocate for increasing awareness and understanding of malignant hypothermia. So it's a, a wonderful, unique opportunity to get his uh, thoughts and perspectives on uh, the past achievements and the future of research in malignant hyperthermia. So to begin with, it's a, it's a large topic. We've come a long way, but I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the early days and the initial recognition of malignant hyperthermia and some of the key people in, involved in that, uh, in that effort. Well, let me start by telling you <clears throat> how I became interested in this syndrome. Uh, I was doing my residency in anesthesiology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Very academically oriented department, and uh, people were always interested in some type of research. Now, in the department was a story about a student nurse that had died several years previously to the time I started um, in the late 1960s. Uh, who died under anesthesia mysteriously. It was later determined that she suffered from a rare disorder called malignant hypothermia. Malignant hypothermia was first described in the early 1960s by uh, Michael Denborough in, from Melbourne, Australia, and his associates. And it was a report of a patient who uh, related that members of his family had died during anesthesia unexpectedly. And uh, the anesthesiologist, uh, Dr. Villiers, and the anesthesia team basically said, well, those were the bad old days. Now we have a, a brand new anesthetic, which should be just fine. Well, that brand new anesthetic was halothane. Uh, so when uh, the anesthetic was administered, the patient started to get hypertensive, started to sweat profusely. The soda lime changed colors, indicating that it was being used up and uh, the temperature was, was going up. So the anesthesiologist, having remembered the pre-op history, uh, decided to stop and treat symptomatically. Now, this was way before the days of dantrolene. So fortunately, they were in a hospital where in an adjacent room they were doing cardiac surgery. And when they were doing cardiac surgery, they would use ice to freeze, not to freeze, but to cool the heart down uh, while they were manipulating the heart. So they went next door, got the ice, packed the patient in ice, and then went back and started to ask more of a history. Now at that time, there was a uh, postgraduate student called Dr. Michael Denborough, a non-anesthesiologist, but interested in, uh, in genetics in general, and medical genetics, and he was dispatched to find out more about this strange case. So he and his associates went to interview the patient and put together a family tree, and it became very obvious that this was a disorder that was inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. And so he reported that first as a letter to the editor um, in the journal Lancet, and then a year or so le later uh, as an article in the British Journal of Anesthesia. And that really put the syndrome on the map. <clears throat> there had been other hints that there might be a syndrome like that but it really wasn't succinctly described the way he did. So initially, it was clear that it was related in many patients to anesthesia, that it was inherited, and the other thing that they found was that the muscle enzymes, the CPK, were elevated in many of the family members. So a lot of the basics of malignant hypothermia were described in those early publications. Now, after that publication came out, there were many people around the world who took notice. And one of the people who especially took notice was an anesthesiologist in Toronto by the name of Dr. Beverly Britt. Uh, 
And Dr. Britt had had her own experience as an anesthesiologist with malignant hypothermia, and she decided to do some investigation. So she went out across the country and did an epidemiologic <clears throat> study of malignant hypothermia and began reporting malignant hypothermia, the inheritance, how it presented, what anesthetics, uh, what was the damage that was done, what was the mortality, which was close to 80% mm. of people who developed the syndrome. And uh, eventually, she uh, uh, organized a workshop in Toronto in the late, in the early 1970s. It was the first international workshop on malignant hypothermia. And there were many people who were interested in the syndrome there. Uh, Mike Denbro couldn't come, but he sent, sent a representative. But there were people like Tom Nelson who was there. And at that time, at that meeting, uh, I heard about the syndrome occurring not only in humans, but also in certain breed of, of swine. And Tom Nelson uh, was a, a, an, an anesthesiologist. He was uh, interested in uh, animal research. Um, and we will have a recording of an interview with, with Tom pretty soon, and he can tell you, you know, his involvement of it. But this was fascinating. Here was a human syndrome that occurred in animals, and it occurred spontaneously, not just with anesthesia. And it was unclear how to, to treat it that, at that time. Now, how did I come to be there at that meeting? After I completed my residency, I took a year of fellowship training in pharmacology. And the pharmacology department at the time had some people very interested in muscle pharmacology. I worked with uh, Niels Haugard, and uh, Paul Bianchi was in the department as well. When they heard about this workshop, we all decided to go and learn about this syndrome. There were case reports, there were case series, and this was eventually published in, in a book uh, on malignant hypothermia. So those, at that time, were the important individuals uh, that were involved in malignant hypothermia. So a lot of the <clears throat> basic aspects of MH were already known from those early observations and the work of Denborough and then Britt in, in Canada. What, what, was the, what was the response of anesthesia in general? I mean, this was a rare syndrome, hadn't been recognized before. What was the general feeling among practicing anesthesiologists? Well, some people said, it's a fiction, never saw it, never heard about it, doesn't exist. Um, but many others became very concerned about it mm -hmm. and uh, tried to recognize the signs of the syndrome. <clears throat> now, it was unclear how to treat it, and it was not even clear how to recognize it because uh, nowadays the earliest sign of malignant hypothermia, besides tachycardia, is a rise in end tidal CO2. And end tidal CO2 wasn't being measured at, at that time. How about temperature? Wasn't that an issue as well? <laughs> temperature, uh, yes, was an issue, and that was one of the leading signs. But temperature at that time, and often today, is not measured routinely during <laughs> anesthesia. Mm. And this has been one of the uh, things that the Malignant Hypothermia Association uh, has advocated for. Um, and now it's just about universal, but there's still times. So early in that time, you were involved with uh, muscle physiologists or pharmacologists, but did you recognize that this was a, a significant clinical problem that might be un unrecognized or unappreciated? Absolutely. First of all, there were more and more case reports, and second of all, going to the conference and hearing uh, clinician after clinician describe the, uh, the syndrome that they encountered you know, convinced me that this was an unrecognized syndrome and in, in anesthesia, during anesthesia, uh, what was so interesting about this is during anesthesia, a patient's body temperature generally cools. Hmm. And here was just the opposite. Not only was the temperature going up, but often the muscles were becoming rigid to the point that the anesthesia hmm. provider couldn't even open the mouth to put the endotracheal tube in. So uh, we didn't know how often it occurred, but we knew it was inherited, so it had to be... Uh, not uncommon in certain families. And you, you also mentioned earlier that there was a case in your training program. Was that part of the influence that uh, spiked your interest in the whole problem? Yes, it was. Not only that, 
But at the time, uh, after that incident, another anesthesiologist who was on staff at the University of Pennsylvania, George Strobel, uh, spent some time in pharmacology, and he uh, began to investigate the characteristics of the syndrome using isolated muscle. And he established a laboratory to begin to study the effects of anesthetics on muscle uh, function. And so when, by the time I came to Penn after I left, after my residency, there was a lab there. And uh, the lab technician, Susan Reed, was very experienced in handling muscle. And so we began exploring the effects of anesthetics uh, on muscle. Is that when you got involved with the caffeine halothane contracture test? Or can you tell us a little bit about how that diagnostic test came about? Well, this is also a very interesting uh, story. Uh, because the syndrome clearly involved muscle, because the, pa the patients, the animals, became rigid, and Beverly Britt was interested in it, at the time there was a, an internationally known pharmacologist by the name of Werner Kahlo. Interestingly, Werner Kahlo had been on the faculty of the pharmacology department uh, hmm. at Penn. So she consulted with, with him. Now, the way I put this together, um, in, in my mind, is when he heard about this increase in muscle tone, he knew that there were certain pharmacologic agents that led to an increase in muscle tone. One of those was caffeine. And so what they decided to do is to biopsy muscle of these pigs who are MH susceptible and see how it responded to both caffeine and to halothane. And sure enough, the muscle contracted to a large extent, much, much greater muscle strength than in, in the normal pig. And they reported that as you know, a, uh, a, a sign of malignant hypothermia, a, a laboratory sign of malignant hypothermia. So the, uh, the issue was, well, we knew that muscle would respond to caffeine and to halothane in an abnormal way. But the question was, how do you standardize a test like that? How do you measure what's normal and what's not normal? It's not zero, no contracture, and then uh, three grams of contracture. There was a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the next things that happened after that meeting um, in Toronto, there were a number of workshops. The first one took place in Galveston, Texas, where uh, Dr. Nelson was and where Dr. Flewellen was. And we talked about the beginnings of standardization of this, of this test. Um, there were subsequent workshops that filled in the gaps to define the muscle that would, should be used, the concentration of the drug, the concentrations of caffeine, uh, the apparatus to be used, and that was the beginnings of the standardization uh, of the caffeine halothane contracture test. And uh, this now, we're in the, in the late 1970s. In the, in the early 1980s, uh, two associations were formed. One, the Malignant Hypothermia Association of the United States, and the other, the European Malignant Hypothermia Group. Both organizations are still very active uh, today. Um, so that's was the beginning of the caffeine halothane contracture test. And that, that test is really still the gold standard today for diagnosing someone's susceptibility to MH. Uh, yes, true? it is. <clears throat> it is. It's just we don't apply it to a large number of people, and in some cases it's been supplanted by genetic testing. But when there is a, a question, the definitive test is the caffeine halothane contracture test, called in Europe the in vitro contracture test. And there are certain centers in the United States that offer that, but fewer than there used to be. Is that a, is that a problem in the field of uh, making s uh, diagnostic services available to people who might be at risk? Well, to an extent it is. There, there used to be about 15 to 20 centers in the United States, um, and gradually the same number in, in the European countries. Uh, but what happened, first of all, this is a rare syndrome. It doesn't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Then the patient has to take off time from work, have a, an open muscle biopsy, and have a period of recovery after that. And the insurance companies, when we approach the insurance companies, and we talked about malignant hypothermia, all they could think about was cancer. And I said, no, we had to go in and educate some of the insurance companies. Some got it, 
and some didn't. So there was a whole question of reimbursement for this test, which was time consuming and required technology, tra transducers, a trip to the operating room, an experienced technician to uh, dissect the muscle, to record the contractures, etc. So over time, many of the centers started to close because it was no longer feasible uh, from an economic point of view to keep it going. So that's still, an, <clears throat> I guess, an important part of MHAUS and your efforts is to try to continue to make sure these kinds of diagnostic services are available to people who might be at risk. Yes, I think there, there, are, there is now one biopsy center in Canada at the University of Toronto, and there are about uh, three or four others in the United States now. Um, and all of them do anywhere from 20 to 40 uh, muscle biopsies a year for malignant hypothermia. Mm -hmm. So that's something people who have MH in their family or may believe they're at risk, that's something that may be recommended to them. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the story of dantrolene, which has really been a godsend in terms of improving uh, recovery from MH? Certainly. Well, there, there was a company uh, located in upstate New York called Nor Norwich Eaton Pharmaceutical, which eventually was bought out by Procter & Gamble. One of the scientists who was there, Dr. Keith Ellis, uh, was experimenting with variations of a drug that they had called macrodantin, a urinary antiseptic drug. And one of the uh, modified molecules had a peculiar effect on the animals that they, in, they were injected. The animals didn't die, but they were found the next morning lying flaccid on the, on, in the cage. Uh, I, had, I interviewed Dr. Ellis not too long ago, and that interview is on the, um, on the MHAUS website. Uh, and so I w welcome people to uh, look at that. And so it was Dr. Ellis who recognized that this drug, which was not a standard muscle relaxant, worked differently, he had already figured that out, hmm. um, might be useful in this syndrome that was marked by muscle rigidity and hypothermia. So he started to ask around um, if anybody would be interested in testing it. He got The earliest response he got was from Dr. Gay Harrison in South Africa. Dr. Harrison had been studying uh, malignant hypothermia for a while uh, in the pigs and could not find any medication that would reverse the syndrome. Um, there is actually an interview with Dr. Harrison that is in the Wood Library Museum which is fascinating, and he tells the story of how it came about. But Dr. Ellis sent him a, some of this drug, and Harrison um, uh, administered it and just was shocked to see how mm. rapidly it worked and how completely it worked. So that was the beginning of, uh, of Dantrolene. So here is this company in Norwich, uh, New York, that um, didn't have a lot of different drugs, but now had this drug and wanted to take it further. And so uh, there was a, um, a, an individual who was associated with Norwich Eaton, Mary Elizabeth Kolb, who saw the great value of this and convinced the company uh, to begin to explore taking it, uh, making it a, uh, a medication that would be available for the market. And so when they went to the FDA, I wasn't there at the time, uh, Jerry Groner played an important role in this, uh, but they brought it to the FDA, and the FDA would, was favorably inclined because here was a medication to treat a disorder that had an 80% mortality. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they said, you show us definitively that this drug works, and I think the number was either 9 or 12 cases, and we'll approve it. So they began a multicenter study. Um, uh, to, to see the efficacy uh, and safety of this drug. And they eventually collected about 36 cases uh, where dantrolene had been used in patients who developed something that looked like the syndrome. The other thing I remember distinctly was um, there was a meeting in, um, in Boston where many people who were interested in malignant hypothermia attended. Uh, including John Ryan, who was doing research on malignant hypothermia at the Mass General. And we all went through about 36 cases where dantrolene was used. 
Um, and many times dantrolene was given much too late, days mm -hmm. after the syndrome. Uh, in, in many cases, the elevated temperature was not due to malignant hypothermia. But we identified nine, ten more definitive cases that showed this episode of malignant hypothermia being reversed uh, by dantrolene. I don't think we knew what dose, <laughs> that would be the proper dose mm -hmm. at that point, uh, but eventually the dose was about two and a half milligrams uh, per kilogram that was uh, decided upon as the efficacious drug. So once that was demonstrated, it was brought to the FDA, and the FDA approved it for, mm -hmm. for use. And although the, the mortality from AMH had begun to decline because people now knew about this syndrome, looking for it, and they would abort the anesthetic or change to a different uh, anesthetic agent so that they would be able to abort the syndrome. So after dantrolene was introduced, uh, the mortality from MH started to decline from 80% to 30%, and then lower than that. Um, <clears throat> dantrolene came in two formulations, one an oral medication and one an intravenous medication. Now, actually, Norwich Eaton had the oral formulation, and that was used in the treatment of spasticity. And so they did have experience with, with the drug. So using it intravenously is what anesthesiologists were accustomed to doing. We don't give oral medications to induce anesthesia. Intra, intravenous drugs, and particularly since this was a crisis, we, we and others immediately saw that you didn't have a lot of time to sit around waiting to confirm the diagnosis. Because the longer you waited, the more likely the patient would have serious complications. This was a syndrome that you had to recognize quickly, marshal the troops, and begin treatment uh, immediately. So that, that was a critical juncture in this story, that dantrolene and the FDA approval and the studies that were done was really a life-saving, game-changing development in the treatment in uh, of malignant hypothermia, but of course the drug has to be available, and I think that's something you've done and MHAUS has done, is to really uh, pu publicize, get the word out there that uh, all facilities that use anesthesia really have to have this drug available. That's correct. Um, I should say that a lot of the research on how to use this drug was done on these animals that were naturally susceptible to malignant hypothermia, and the lion's share of that research in the United States was done by Jerry Gronert, who was at Mayo at that time, and Tom Nelson, who was at, in Houston, the U, U of T. Tom eventually moved to uh, uh, Bowman Gray in North Carolina. Now, Dantrolene, Dan I understand, is a little bit complicated to prepare, and but there are new developments and new forms. Can you talk about that a little bit? Certainly. Uh, the initial formulation of Dantrolene um, was, is one that is difficult to get into solution. So the uh, company, which was now Procter & Gamble, uh, sold it in vials that had 20 milligrams of, of dantrolene and mannitol that you had to add 60 ml of bacteriostatic sterile water uh, to shake it up to get that 20 milligrams. Now, since patients need anywhere from 2.5 to 10 milligrams uh, of dantrolene for treatment, you could see that you had to have 9, 10, 12, 15 vials of this mm. stuff being mixed up and administered. So you virtually had to have a second group of people just preparing the dantrolene. And time is of the essence. And you time really is of the to essence. Get it done quickly. And that's still the case now uh, in, in many centers. Let me jump ahead a little bit. Uh, everybody knew that dantrolene was life saving was difficult to prepare, and had to be administered very rapidly. Then uh, a company came along who had technology to make insoluble drugs soluble. Uh, this company is called Eagle Pharmaceuticals, located in upstate New Jersey, and they created a dantrolene formulation uh, whereby 50 milligrams of dantrolene, when you add uh, sterile, sterile bacteriostatic water, would be, you'd make 50 milligrams of, of dantrolene. So one vial was the, of the Ryanodex, they called it, was the equivalent of about 12 vials of the dantrium. The 
effective treatment dose was determined in animal studies to be 2.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight. A kilogram is equal to 2.2 uh, pounds. So there had to be a calculation that went along with that, and the average patient would require 9 or 10 vials of, of this preparation. Um, time went by, and then generic formulations of dantrium uh, came along, and there are two generic formulations at the present time. Uh, Ryanodex is much more uh, rapid to prepare. All you need is one vial. You don't need a team of people to, uh, to mix the drug and proved in animal and human studies to be effective and was approved by the FDA about three or four years ago. So that was a, a significant uh, development. I don't want to be biased, and I hope this doesn't come across that way, but some of the, you'd think that people would pick up on this pretty quickly, um, but uh, Brianodex is more expensive than the dantrolene preparations, and it's used rather infrequently. So uh, companies, as well as ambulatory centers, have held back on replacing their dantrolene formulations uh, with the newer formulation. But the, the key is, regardless of the questions of the formulation, the critical thing is to have dantrolene available as soon as possible to save the, the person's life. I, I thought maybe we can move on to talking about the malignant hyperthermia association itself. If you could tell us a little bit about how that started and your perception about the role it has played in advancing treatment of malignant hypothermia and something about the organization itself. Sure, I'd love to do that. <laughs> so there I was at the, um, now on the attending staff of the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and we had begun to do muscle biopsies uh, to do the caffeine halothane contracture test. And one of the patients that came for such testing was a woman by the name of Sue Ellen Gallimore. Sue Ellen was very concerned because a relative of hers had died from malignant hypothermia um, in the late 1970s in Chicago. And so after she was tested and it was found to be positive and it was clear that this syndrome was in her family, uh, she approached me afterwards and said, you know, what if we put together a small organization and created a newsletter so that anesthesiologists and patients would be aware of this. Because she herself had a great deal of difficulty uh, once she knew she had malignant hypothermia. Not every hospital would agree to take care of her or her family. So she came to me uh, with that idea and I said, that's wonderful. By the time she did, that was in about early uh, part of 1981, and I had moved over to become the chairman of anesthesiology at Hahnemann Medical School in Philadelphia. So uh, we, she gathered together three other people. One was the father of the, the young man who died, Owen Davison. Another was uh, Bob Lukritz, whose daughter developed malignant hypothermia. And the other one was George Masick, who had a son who had a problem with malignant hypothermia. So we met in, uh, at Hahnemann, uh, and I was asked to join as the scientific advisor at the time. And so we began to discuss how do we get the word out? How do we get preparation uh, out there? Well, we created a, a newsletter, and that newsletter is called The Communicator, still published today. Um, and the other thing we did was went to the anesthesiology meetings, the big meetings. And um, in the early 1980s, we would go to the meetings, and for a couple of years, people would come by, and they'd look at the sign and say, what's malignant hypothermia? <laughs> Many anesthesia providers didn't know anything <laughs> about it. Um, and so we knew we had a lot of education to do in terms of recognizing the signs and having dantrolene available. Uh, and so that was the initial mission. So you were really there at the beginning, uh, at the birth of the organization, and it was very much a patient and family advocacy, advocacy group from the beginning. And I understand the patients uh, and families are still involved to this day. It's uh, still an important part of the organization. Absolutely. We have several uh, people who are MH susceptible themselves on our board, uh, in addition to uh, many physician anesthesiologists. 
you're on the board, Stan, representing uh, other heat syndromes, mm -hmm. which may or may not cross over to malignant hypothermia. So the first thing we did was, um, and this is before the internet, we started sending out the communicator. I would write articles, uh, the executive director at the time, Sue Ellen, would write articles, other people who were interested in malignant hypothermia would write articles, and we'd send it out uh, in the mail. Uh, one time at one of our board meetings um, in 1982, uh, Mrs. Gallimore came up with the idea of why not have some kind of telephone system so if a clinician was having a problem with these patients and it was an emergency, they'd be able to speak to someone immediately who was knowledgeable. And that was the birth of the hotline. And so we were able to gather together uh, about 12 or 15 people who had expertise in malignant hypothermia to serve on the hotline, including Jerry Gronert uh, and, and Beverly Britt and um, many other individuals who, who began to donate their time uh, to be available. Uh, so that's how the hotline came about. So that, that remains a very unique and critical service where patients, families, or professionals have access to the experts on malignant hypothermia during a crisis or otherwise, and it's totally gratis. I mean, this is all a, a part of the organization's volunteer effort. Well, let me just make one uh, correction. Although the organization welcomes patients to inquire about mm -hmm. malignant hypothermia, the hotline is meant for clinicians um, experiencing the problem. And the clinicians could be an anesthesiologist, could be a nurse anesthetist, could be a surgeon, could be an intensivist, could be an emergency room physician. And you're right, it was offered gratis. We didn't charge anybody. We did get some support from a number of different uh, organizations uh, to support the hotline. Well, that's a good point to clarify. If patients or families have questions, they can contact the office directly or by email. And I understand there are a lot of products and the materials that the uh, office can provide uh, to people who have questions. Well, yes, when we began to realize that there was a need for education, we realized that a, a newsletter wasn't sufficient. Mm. And so some of the things that we began to do was to create um, a training videos, uh, and, and including a mock drill uh, in the operating room, so people can see uh, what, what goes along. We created uh, manuals for uh, hospitals and ambulatory centers, uh, giving examples of policies, what should they keep in the MH cart, um, how to deploy this, how to implement the treatment of malignant hypothermia. And one of the things that we developed along the way was uh, a, a treatment algorithm, a posters so that can be put on the wall of the operating room because people don't remember how to treat a, a rare disease. And this has to happen quickly so people can quickly refer to the signs, the symptoms, the treatment, the, the complications uh, of this. I should say that this was not created by one person. Uh, well, by that time, we had created a professional advisory council. And there were many well-known people on that professional advisory council. And when we would have meetings, we discuss these, this treatment algorithm poster, and it became refined over the years. So for example, Every year at the American Society of Anesthesiologists, we would have a breakfast meeting of all the hotline consultants, mm. and we discuss cases. And they bring us the interesting cases, the not so interesting cases, uh, for us to talk about, and also to refine uh, the information that we were putting out at the time. Right. So there's constant learning, even within the group of experts, from the information that come from people people in the field. So the, these written materials and the, the M MHAUS offers actual drills or experts to go to places to make sure the teams can work together in a crisis and, and deal with this problem. I understand that it's even uh, expected from accreditation agencies that uh, people are familiar with these techniques. Um, that's correct. The development of what we call the MH Prep Check, whose concept was developed by Diane Doherty, our executive director, so that an expert, when asked, would go to a facility and observe an MH drill and 
provide a uh, critique of that, of how it was conducted. And the prep check has been very successful. Uh, we've had people go as far away as Alaska and as uh, far away as uh, the Florida Keys to, uh, to provide a prep check. It's really fascinating to do this, to see how people uh, carry out these MH drills. Now, uh, much to our surprise, because we didn't really advocate for it, uh, organizations such as the Joint Commission uh, felt that this was such a, uh, an important um, mechanism for treatment of a rare disorder that was potentially fatal, uh, and we had stated in our literature that facilities should do a yearly drill so that they were prepared when the actual thing happened. And that became incorporated into the standards for the Joint Commission and for accrediting agencies for many ambulatory centers. Um, let me give you a little twist to that as well, uh, jumping ahead. So recently, uh, the Joint Commission, when they come along and look for evidence of having do you have dantrolene available within 10 minutes? Of course, that's what our professional advisory council recommended. And they also asked for evidence of doing these drills. But they don't ask only for evidence of doing the drills in the operating room. They also look for evidence of doing these drills in the emergency room, in the ICU. And that, that is because in those areas, those places don't use inhalation anesthetics, which is one of the triggers, but they use succinylcholine for management of the airway. And it's very well known that succinylcholine can trigger malignant hypothermia. Maybe not uh, as often as the potent inhalation drugs, but it is a trigger. So the Joint Commission and other organizations instituted this, this policy. Well, I know that's become an issue for, for MHAUS in that these agents are used even outside of the hospital in ambulatory centers and surgical centers, which have proliferated throughout the country. That, that's also been something that you've worked on, making dantrolene available in those places. Well, we've advocated that those that all facilities that provide uh, general anesthesia, either using the inhalation agents or succinylcholine, be prepared to treat malignant hypothermia. Now, years before, we had come up with the uh, idea um, that the adequate amount of dantrolene in the older formulation, dantrium, should be 36 vials on hand because that would be about 10 milligrams per kilogram in, uh, in an average or a little bit uh, larger average size patient. So we began to advocate for 36 vials, um, and that's what we still do because uh, there's mm -hmm. no evidence that, to the contrary. Um, it, it has become a very controversial mm. situation because malignant hypothermia is a low-frequency, low high-impact um, disorder. And, you know, you don't see low-frequency uh, disorders, right. you know, too right. frequently. And so there are some facilities who say, we've been providing anesthesia for 10 years, I never saw a case of malignant mm -hmm. hypothermia that they, sure. they knew of. But, you know, it's the same thing with having a fire extinguisher or a defibrillator. You may never have to use it. Mm -hmm. So well, anyway. Yeah. Well, M MHAUS has obviously accomplished a lot uh, in, in p terms of patient safety. But maybe we should talk some about the MH registry and, and the, the history of that and how that works together with MHAUS. Um, absolutely. Um, Long about the mid-1980s, there were a number of t uh, testing centers for malignant hypothermia. And each center would do the testing a little bit differently. Some of them would use one type of muscle. Some of them would do an exposure to a lower concentration of halothane, different concentrations of caffeine. And we began to realize that we needed to standardize as much as we could the testing. So we decided to have a series of standardization conferences in the, in the 1980s. Uh, I'd asked Marilyn Larrick to be the recording secretary. She was very interested in the, in the syndrome. And indeed, she and Greg Allen and other people put together a number of papers, and we came to a more or less standard approach to, to treating, uh, to diagnosing malignant hypothermia in the, in the laboratory. Now, at the same time, we would say, 
well, how do we know that these patients that you're testing, they may have an abnormal contracture, but how do we know they really had malignant hypothermia? Well, we said we need to record the actual uh, series of changes that took place during the episode and see whether the experts think that that was malignant hypothermia and compare that to mm -hmm. the muscle response. And so that was the beginnings of the MH registry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Larrick at the time was at Penn State Hershey and got the support of the chair, Julian Bebeck, to begin to create this database called the MH Registry. And uh, anesthesiologists would report their cases on a, on a data sheet, which was a little bit complex. And that how, is how the registry began. After a number of years, things change, people leave, um, and the registry moved to the University of Pittsburgh where uh, Barbara Brandon was located. Barbara is a, uh, a pediatric anesthesiologist with a deep interest in malignant hypothermia. And she uh, took the registry, expanded it to a more robust database, and uh, was, began to look at the database to draw conclusions. So let me give you one example about this. So if you look at the actual cases of malignant hypothermia and the time progression, uh, it became very clear that the longer you waited to treat with dantrolene, the more complications. They also noted that um, malignant hypothermia could recrudesce, could reappear mm. within 24 hours. So our treatment algorithm with dantrolene went from acute treatment in the operating room to more or less continuous treatment in the ICU. Um, that's just two examples of the data that continues to come out from, uh, from the MH registry. So that was designed to be a repository for all kinds of in useful information about people who have MH and that might be available to them, but certainly uh, a source for research to uh, advance our understanding of M MH. Well, that leads to the other question about an important part of the mission of MHAUS was also to promote scientific uh, uh, advancement. And you, I know you've been, uh, had a great deal of insight and foresight about uh, 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 things like that. And so if, uh, if you could talk a bit about the relationship between MH and uh, uh, heat stroke, uh, exercise-related changes, and the whole story of, of genetics of MH and uh, where, where that is at this time. Well, that's kind of a complicated uh, <laughs> question. We would hold scientific meetings from time to time, um, and we'd hold registry meetings where we talk about the manifestations of malignant hypothermia in other situations. So let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, we knew that MH was inherited as an autosomal dominant, and there was an animal model. And so where there's inherited disease, there's a gene. There's got to be a gene that linked to it, linked to it. And Dr. Britt uh, had available to her another premier researcher at the University of uh, Toronto, Dr. David M uh, McLennan. And Dr. McLennan had been studying uh, calcium in, uh, in muscle and genetic changes and channels. And so they began to look at uh, where is the gene in these animals. And before too long, they found that the gene that was behind malignant hypothermia was called the ryanodine receptor, and it, which is a calcium channel in muscle. Uh, I don't want to give the whole pathophysiology of MH, but he was a gene. So everybody thought, aha, we have a gene, now we can test for the gene, and we can identify. Well, you can do that in animals, but people are much more <laughs> difficult. So uh, the, the uh, screening of pig herds because no one wanted to invest in, in raising an animal that died on the way to the slaughterhouse, which was what happened in many cases. So many of the pig breeds, uh, herds, are screened to see whether they have this uh, ryanodine receptor mutation, and they're culled out of the, uh, out of the herd. Uh, so that was a good use, an excellent use, of this uh, genetic uh, test. And it was priced at a very low level, so it would be uh, used more frequently. Um, now, in the human situation, 
it was found that uh, it was much more difficult because you couldn't take a human um, and see if they had this ryanodine receptor change and then test them with <laughs> one, of the, one of the drugs, so you had to build it backwards. And we found that many people had changes in the ryanodine receptor, and, but there are many people who didn't. Mm. Then we're now entering the genetic age, where not only can you identify the gene, but you can also identify the mutations within that gene. And there's been a lot of research in that. Uh, it turns out that the ryanodine receptor type 1 gene is one of the largest genes in, in our body. And there are hundreds and hundreds of base pairs. And to date, there are about 400 changes, 400 base pairs that are changed in people who have malignant hypothermia. That doesn't mean that those are all causal for malignant hypothermia, because just because you have a change doesn't mean that's a causal factor. To make a very long story short, uh, the European MH group in particular started to put together uh, the relationship between the genetic changes and the clinical presentation of malignant hypothermia. This was also done in the United States. It was done uh, in Canada. And at the annual European MH group meeting, people would report on the genetic changes and begin to do some testing to see how significant those changes were in terms of muscle function. One of the other centers that invested a lot of time and energy in the molecular genetics of malignant hypothermia was the Uniform Services University. That was, uh, the department was led by Dr. Sheila Muldoon, and she has a, uh, an expert geneticist, uh, Kishka Sambugan, and they started to look at the genetics of malignant hypothermia. At some point, Dr. Muldoon and my lab started to collaborate, and I would provide specimens, they would do the genetics, and we'd compare them. So at this point in time, there are known to be at least 35 mutations associated with malignant hypothermia. Many of the others are called uh, variants of unknown significance, which is frustrating, but that's the way it is. You don't want to uh, label sure, someone sure. With, a, a, with a disorder that doesn't, that doesn't have So it. this is still a very active area of research, really Correct. the future of medicine in, in general. But in a, in, a, in a capsule summary, what would your opinion be a recommendation to somebody who wanted genetic testing? I mean, where are we in terms of genetic testing compared to the contracture test? to compare to clinical implications. What would you recommend someone who asked about that? The answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do testing on a patient uh, where there is a, a low likelihood of the patient being MH susceptible because the statistics that relate to sensitivity, specificity, mm -hmm. positive and negative predictive value show that uh, if the patient doesn't have certain signs, the likelihood of finding a, a change is low. And this is definitely an evolving situation. So there are some centers and some recommendations that the first test in a patient who has uh, a fairly clear episode of malignant hypothermia should be genetic testing. Now there are a couple of different centers who can do genetic testing. One of them is prevention genetics in, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Uh, also, Emory uh, has a, a, a sophisticated genetics testing center. Uh, the University of Toronto also uh, has a sophisticated genetics uh, testing center. So if the patient, for example, had a convincing or somewhat convincing case of malignant hypothermia, but didn't have a genetic change, then you might resort to the contracture test to see whether they really do have susceptibility. Other centers, particularly in Europe, feel that the first test should be the contracture test mm. so that you know what you're dealing with and then go on to genetic testing. The value of the genetic testing is that if you find a, uh, a mutation associated with MH in one family member, you can look for that change in other family members. If they have it, then you know the patient is MH susceptible. And here's one of the uh, other important points. If they don't have that change, you cannot rule mm -hmm. out susceptibility because we don't know where all right. the genetic changes right. are, and they may have another genetic change. So it's one of those things that when you have it, you know you have it. 
uh, high specificity, but the low sensitivity. Right. The research studies that are being done on larger numbers of patients uh, show that anywhere between 50 and 70 percent of patients who have what's felt to be a case of malignant hypothermia uh, will have a genetic change associated with it, but that's not 100 percent, it's not even 95 percent. Uh, let me just backtrack a little bit because one of the questions is, how do you know the patient had a clinical episode of malignant hypothermia? Is it based on the temperature elevation? Is it based on rigidity? Is it based on increased metabolism? How do you measure mm -hmm. it? Is it based on muscle breakdown? Well, Dr. Larrick, uh, uh, in conjunction with some, some other individuals, uh, decided to do a study to produce a grading scale to uh, provide a probability number for uh, malignant hypothermia. The clinical grading scale was published in anesthesiology is used in many parts of the world and there's a scoring system so that if you have uh, an increase in temperature, uh, an increase in metabolism, increased significant increase in muscle breakdown, uh, you can get one score. If you're missing one or two of the things, you get a lower score. It's not perfect, far from perfect, but it's kind of an indication of what yes. might be going on. But regarding the genetic testing, it does sound complicated and if anyone has questions, they really ought to uh, contact and maybe MHAUS office for more information and have their doctor or someone talk to really an expert on malignant hyperthermia. The other thing that's interesting to me about the genetic testing showing that there's uh, maybe a, a ryanidine receptor defect associated with MH uh, is the re research showing that this may have implications outside of the operating room that people with this uh, genetic abnormality may be vulnerable to episodes or symptoms, not just during anesthesia, but even in other situations like during heat waves. Um, yes. Let me add, first of all, that the ryanidine receptor uh, gene is associated with the vast majority of MH cases, but there are two other genes as well. What, one is the CACNA1S uh, gene, which is another channel within muscle, and another is called the STAC3 gene, mm -hmm. which is right. first described in a tribe of Indians, interestingly, uh, but is found in other parts uh, of the world. Now, the interesting association between syndromes that occur outside the operating room was that if an MH case occurs in the operating room, the anesthesia provider has all kinds of ways to measure metabolism. CO2 excretion, for example, heart rate, blood pressure, blood gases. But if something happens like heat stroke outside the operating room, you don't know what's mm -hmm. really going on. And there was always a suspicion that some people, much like the, the pigs, could trigger into an MH-like syndrome just on exposure to heat and exercise and some of those patients actually had muscle breakdown as well, called rhabdomyolysis. So we couldn't do very much about connecting that. But then we had the genetics. So now we were able to test those patients who had heat stroke, muscle breakdown, uh, whether with exercise uh, alone or in the presence of a hot environment, and observe whether they had genetic changes that are similar or identical to the ones found in malignant hypothermia. <clears throat> this is a little bit controversial right now, but there is definitely an association between some patients who, are at, uh, who develop heat stroke and heat-related uh, collapse and malignant hypothermia. I can't say whether that is 10%, 20%. A lot of the studies are indicating about 30% of heat stroke patients have this genetic change. Now again, is that true, true, and unrelated, or is it, is it causal? And this is mm -hmm. one of the debates that are, are going on. The consequence of that is, if someone has a genetic change of, in the ryanidine receptor, what do you tell them about playing sports, mm -hmm. doing exercise, you know, yeah. in a hot environment? Um, the military, for example, uh, for a long time has excluded patients who are MH susceptible from joining the military mm. because you never know what kind of environment they're working in. But this has raised all kinds of issues that is 
completely unsettled uh, right now. But that's one association. The other association between MH uh, and other myopathies, other muscle diseases, rarer myopathies, but nevertheless myopathies. Um, and there are a certain number of uh, muscle diseases characterized by muscle weakness that are clearly related to malignant hypothermia. The one that comes to mind most often is central core disease, which is a defined uh, syndrome uh, of muscle. Uh, and several other syndromes where there are muscle changes that take place. Many of those patients are at risk to developing malignant hypothermia. But then there is another disorder that was originally thought to be directly related to malignant hypothermia, but doesn't seem to be quite a one-to-one -one association, and that's Duchenne dystrophy. What began to be noted in uh, patients, and many of these were hotline calls, you'd have a young boy who would have an anesthetic and have a, a collapse either at the end of the anesthetic or in the recovery room. And they would manifest hyperkalemia, elevated potassium, and significant muscle breakdown, not so much elevated temperature. And muscle breakdown and hyperkalemia are two cardinal signs of malignant hypothermia. Now, the testing on those patients in the contracture test uh, was not always indicative of malignant hypothermia. And probably the patients who have muscular dystrophy um, uh, develop an MH-like syndrome that develops in a different pathway. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but what we don't think is due to the same defect because the defect in muscular dystrophy is located in a different protein called dystrophin, um, which is a structural protein uh, of muscle. So that's another syndrome that some of us believe those patients should not be given MH trigger agents. Uh, other people are a little bit looser in that. Well, we covered a tremendous amount of ground, and so much has been done and is being done. And in the last few minutes, could you kind of peer into the future and give us your thoughts about what are the opportunities and challenges in terms of malignant hyperthermia and in terms of uh, the MHAUS organization itself? Well, one of the challenges of dealing with a disorder that occurs uh, and maybe one in 25,000 anesthetics is just, it's not a, uh, something that everybody knows about. You can't go out and, and fundraise easily for this. Uh, the fundraising, keeping the organization going, has depended mm. a good deal on voluntary contributions from anesthesia societies like the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and, and other societies that have made contributions and voluntary contributions from, from uh, individuals. Now, interestingly enough, um, during these years, we began to develop educational programs that were, and membership in the organization as well. So we get a certain amount of money from the membership, and we get a, an amount of money by selling our educational products. What is most interesting to me that the largest segment of our uh, membership comes from operating room nurses. So the operating room nurses have a deep interest in protecting the patient and being prepared when this syndrome uh, occurs. So the uh, Association of Operating Room Nurses has been an important supporter of, uh, of malignant hypothermia. Um, it's difficult to get uh, scientific grants, although we've gotten some over the years, particularly from the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Um, and uh, so it's through grant funding, uh, voluntary contributions, corporate contributions, um, as well as sale of products. So of course, the companies that manufacture the antidote, the Antrium, um, support the organization. They may give funds, but they don't dictate what we do or how we do it. Um, it's to support the educational activities uh, of the organization. And actually, over the years, the percentage support for our organization derived from, corporate, from corporations has diminished greatly to now it's less than 25%.
So, so support from many of these sources is so important to continue the work of MHA US to reduce the incidence and the mortality from um, MH. As rare as it is, it's devastating when it happens, and it's great that MHA, you and MHA US can be there for these people. Well, I couldn't have done this myself. Uh, we've had a very active board, still do. We have a very active professional advisory council. The hotline consultants have been very active. We have a discussion list where we exchange information uh, about cases. So uh, the MHA US is actually the tip of the iceberg of the organization that deals with uh, malignant hypothermia. Now, the mortality rate from MH clearly has declined. I can't tell you whether it's 10%, 5%, 12%, the numbers floating around in that, in that, mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that there are one, two, three deaths from malignant hypothermia that we know about every year in the United States. Now, in the United States, we have dantrolene, but there are many countries that don't have dantrolene. So there are many more deaths in other countries <laughs> uh, because they don't have dantrolene and are not prepared for malignant hypothermia. That's a whole other type of uh, area of need. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the first world countries are pretty much prepared for this in, in most cases. Uh, the second and third world countries, not so much because dantrolene to the health budget is, sure. uh, takes, takes a big portion of the budget. Now, going forward, um, what one of the challenges is going to be, what do you tell people who have a genetic change in terms of exercise and heat? And the other challenge is very soon everybody is part of their maybe annual physical examination or their physical examination in their lifetime will have their genetic profile characterized. And already this is happening. And people are having the genetics done for re reasons not related to MH, but they turn up with a ryanodine mutation that may or may not be uh, one of the causal mutations. What do you do about that? What do you tell the general practitioner, mm -hmm. you know, or the surgeon? who's faced with a patient who comes in and says, look, I have this genetic change which predisposes me to malignant hypothermia. What do I do yeah, about it? Yeah. So it's not just an anesthesia problem. It's a problem for those people interested in sports medicine and for anybody taking care mm -hmm. of, uh, of patients in or outside the operating room. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. That was truly wonderful uh, to kind of pick your brain and get a unique perspective on the history of MH and MHAUS and everything that's been accomplished and how important it is to continue the work uh, going forward with a, a large community of people who are expert and uh, committed to uh, uh, mastering this problem. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. Uh, and thank you be, for being a faithful board member for MHAUS for uh, 20 years. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you during that time. Same here.